Welcome to the vast expanse known as Canada, the largest country in the Americas and the second largest in the world, with an abundance of space and resources. Covering a total of 3.85 million square miles, Canada is almost 1.6 times larger than its southern neighbor, the United States. Yet despite its size, a staggering 80% of Canadians live within just 100 miles of the United States border. This border, first drawn in the late 1700s after the United States gained independence and added to throughout the 19th century, still defines the geographical boundary between the two countries, and today stretches 5,525 miles in length. In comparison to other countries, Canada has a relatively low population density of approximately 11 people per square mile, making it one of the least densely populated nations in the world closer in population density to countries like Guyana and Iceland than the United States, which has 91 people per square mile, or Japan, which has 854. So then why with so much land at their disposal and with continuous efforts to expand away from the border and to the north, do Canadians tend to cluster so close to their neighbors to the south? The story behind this population pattern is as intriguing as the history of the Canada-United States border itself, with its roots dating back to the first settlers and taking several twists and turns along the way. The United States and Canada, the two largest nations in the Americas, possess a shared and intricate history both countries emerged from the New World, with settlers from Western Europe, mainly from Britain, France, and Spain, shaping their foundations. They shared a common land, religion, and culture, predominantly Protestant and rooted in the common law legal tradition. The most significant divergence occurred when the southern region gained independence, becoming the United States of America. Meanwhile, British Canada remained loyal to Britain, giving rise to a unique border. This border, a de facto line on future maps, resembled those later drawn between India and Pakistan post-Indian independence in 1947 and Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State, later the Republic of Ireland in 1937, after the Irish War of Independence in 1921. And just like in those other examples, there were many who didn't agree with this new border. Native tribes like the Blackfoot, which span both the United States and Canada, have clans on either side of the border. They perceive themselves as a single nation, with the Blackfoot Nation, for example, comprising roughly 16,000 members, 7,000 in the United States, and 9,000 in Canada. Canada's First Nation tribes, with a total population exceeding 1.7 million people and representing over 600 different nations, maintain historical and cultural ties with the United States. European settlers primarily arrived in Canada from France and Great Britain in the 17th and 18th centuries, attracted by the lucrative fur trade and fishing industry. By the end of the 18th century, the fur trade, with beaver fur as the most sought after, had become Canada's largest export. Similar to the United States, most European settlers in Canada initially concentrated in the northeast near oceans or rivers with ocean access. This made travel back to Europe more convenient and also fostered the growth of the fishing industry. Upon arrival, the settlers discovered the Great Lakes region, spanning both the United States and Canada, to be ideal for farming. The original border was designed in part to fairly, if not evenly, distribute lakeland and ocean access. Consequently, Canada's most densely populated area extended from the Great Lakes along the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic Ocean. This region includes the cities of Quebec City, Montreal, and Toronto, which form a relatively straight line along the peninsula extending into the Great Lakes area. This positioning places Canada's traditional economic and population centers in close proximity to the states of New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Michigan. As of 2021, approximately 61% of Canada's population resided in these areas. The first attempt at a peaceful resolution between the longtime rivals, with Canada still officially part of Britain, was the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Created during the aftermath of the American Revolution, part of the treaty focused on the resources of the new nation. Both sides agreed the border would be drawn in the north, extending from Nova Scotia to the Connecticut River. However, knowledge of what exactly this would mean was limited to the incomplete understanding of the New World's geography. For instance, it hadn't been long since California was depicted as an island on maps, a mistake that wouldn't be realized until 1747. The unusual border that was eventually established was not anticipated at the time of the initial agreement. 
The first major border conflict broke out in 1812 when James Madison got the notion in his head to annex British Canada and make the territory another state in the rapidly expanding USA, assuming that he'd be able to take over the territory without too much trouble. The smaller British forces and their native allies proved much tougher than expected though, and the war basically ended in a stalemate, with neither side gaining any land, but not before the British pushed back and actually burned down the first incarnation of the White House before leaving. The negotiated peace in 1814 led to the Treaty of Ghent, which reset the boundaries and had both sides agreeing to stay on their own land, and the rush Bagot Pact of 1817 further solidified the border. So that took care of the border around the Great Lakes, but what about the huge straight part of the border? The part you probably actually think of when imagining the US-Canadian border. Well, that came from Western expansion. Both the US and Canada were pushing towards the Rocky Mountains, leading to further negotiations about who had what, with the Treaty of 1818 basically agreeing to uphold the previous agreement about what the border should be, extending the established line all the way out to the Pacific Ocean, and with both sides losing areas they wanted in the deal. Things were fairly quiet for nearly 20 years until 1842, when disputes arose concerning the border between Maine and New Brunswick. Some believed that surveying errors had occurred, leading to the Webster-Ashburton Treaty of 1842. This treaty had only added more confusion to the already peculiar eastern border. The Rocky Mountains were still a problem though, with the Treaty of 1818 ending at this natural border. US President James Knox Polk insisted during his campaign that the area, now the Canadian province of British Columbia, should belong to the United States, a conviction that led to the popular slogan, 5440 or fight. Despite Polk's unexpected win in 1845, the 1846 Treaty of Oregon prevented war between the United States and pre-Confederation British Canada. The dispute over islands beyond mainland British Columbia was largely resolved by the Pig War, which was basically what it sounds like. In 1859, an American settler, Lyman Cutlar, killed a British farmer's pig, claiming land rights in the disputed area of the San Juan Islands under the Donation Land Claim Act. This even led to an official declaration of war between the then-independent Vancouver Island and the state of Washington. Although troops were sent, no casualties were recorded other than the unfortunate pig. The war ended with the decision that awarded the San Juan Islands to the United States, causing the British Canadians to withdraw. Despite efforts to clearly define the border between the United States and Canada, which itself became independent in 1867, some inconsistencies remain. One example is Minnesota's Northwest Angle, further north than any point in the lower 48 states. Although much of the Northwest Angle is physically within the established border of Canada, it is officially part of Minnesota. This geographical oddity began with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. The initial agreement between the United States and Britain drew the border between various established points, specifically from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River and then west of Lake Superior, the northern end at the Lake of the Woods, a route that put the majority of the angle within the Canadian province of Manitoba. The demarcation, while intentional, was based at least partly on a historical misunderstanding of the region, which stemmed from explorer John Mitchell depicting the Lake of the Woods as being basically egg-shaped, which, as we know today, is not the case. Today, the only indication of the border anomaly is a road sign informing drivers that they are entering the United States. A critical feature on the Canadian side of the border, intentionally preserved by the Paris Treaty, is the St. Lawrence River, home to some of Canada's first non-coastal settlements. It hosts two of Canada's largest and wealthiest cities, Toronto and Montreal. Before cars or trains, Sea access was crucial for some commerce and connections to Europe, unlike the United States, where trains led to the spread of major cities throughout the country, Canadian commerce and most of its population remained in traditional centers like Toronto, which already had a population of 20,000 people by 1890. An increased need for shipping led to improvements in the St. Lawrence Waterway beginning with the introduction of locks allowing vessels as large as 186 feet long to easily pass from the city to the sea and Europe beyond. An added benefit to the location, 
After the border and trade negotiations were initially resolved around the time of the rush bagot Treaty in 1817, was that Canada found a willing and mostly friendly trading partner in nearby states, particularly New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. This led to the construction of the Erie Canal in 1821, which is 363 miles long and took eight years to complete. The canal was primarily intended to transport materials from Hamilton, Ontario, near Toronto, which was historically known as a steel town. But there is a class of boat, called the Great Lakes Freighter, used by both the United States and Canada, that is allowed to pass freely over the Great Lakes. You see, the waters of these lakes are officially owned by the public due to a legal principle called the Public Trust Doctrine. Cooperation between the two countries began to extend to the St. Lawrence Waterway in the 1890s, and by 1959, the waterway was fully open, rendering the Erie Canal mostly obsolete. Another factor keeping the majority of Canadians in the St. Lawrence region wasn't an economic one, but an actual physical barrier, the Canadian Shield. This is the name for an exposed portion of the North American Creighton, part of the continental crust that runs from Mexico up through Canada and over to Greenland. It is a formidable landscape of mostly rock, with over 2.7 billion years of geological history that covers approximately 4.4 million square miles, making it one of the largest geological regions in the world. But this also makes it completely unsuitable for construction or agriculture, so not an ideal place to build a city. While some of the Canadian Shield extends into the United States, Northwest Ontario, Canada experiences the most significant impact. The Canadian Shield makes up roughly half of Canada's land mass, particularly in the north to south direction, hindering western expansion for over a century. Only the maritime provinces, New Finland, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, the southern west portion of Manitoba, the southern ends of Saskatchewan and Alberta, and all of British Columbia and the Yukon Territory, fall outside the main part of the Canadian Shield, which makes any east to west travel a very bumpy ride. While a handful of intrepid individuals, primarily freelance French traders known as voyageurs, ventured west since the 1760s, founding settlements like Portage La Prairie, which is basically French for we have to carry the canoe how far, settlement beyond the Canadian Shield was not a priority. However, as waves of immigrants arrived in North America, particularly from Ireland, during the devastating potato famine which lasted from 1845 to 1849 and resulted in the death of nearly one million people and the immigration of another million, the situation changed. Cities like New York and Boston experienced similar surges in Irish immigrants, and the once abundant fertile farmland of Quebec and Ontario became scarce. The Canadian government, recognizing the need for economic expansion for their new nation, established by the British North America Act of 1867, turned their attention westward, beyond the formidable Canadian Shield. Pioneers venturing through the Canadian Shield eventually reached Canada's vast prairie region, one such group, the Selkirk Settlers, aptly named due to them coming from Selkirk, England, made it as far as the Red River region in the wild territory of Rupert's Land in 1812. Although they engaged in some agriculture, the settlers primarily focused on hunting, trapping, and the booming fur trade around the area's numerous lakes. This dashed Lord Selkirk's hopes that the settlers would serve as a supply base for the Hudson's Bay Company, a famously strict organization willing to use violence to protect its territory. Consequently, the company allowed settlements in Rupert's land. However, for the next few decades until the 1860s, apart from a few bold settlers and Hudson's Bay Company employees, Canada's western expanse saw little immigration or development. In 1867, Canada's first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, met with his Minister of Defense, and that's defense spelled the British way with a C, George Etienne Cartier and Senator George Brown to discuss a Western strategy. With the 1783 Paris Treaty allowing for the Western expansion without stepping on American toes, their priority was to expand the Red River settlement just beyond the most challenging parts of the Canadian Shield. The Red River area, already infamous for its lawlessness and the violent Pemmican War between the Northwest Company and the more dominant Hudson's Bay Company, posed a challenge for expansion. 
From 1812 to 1821, these companies engaged in a series of armed conflicts over trapping rights in the region, with the government being too decentralized to intervene. The conflict finally concluded with the absorption of the Northwest Company into the Hudson's Bay Company. By 1866, the Red River region was gradually slipping from the grasp of the Hudson's Bay Company, which was funded by the British government. At its peak, the company generated an annual revenue of more than 500,000 pounds per year, the equivalent to around 50 million pounds today from the fur trade alone. The Canadian government expedited this process by buying out the company's monopoly for 300,000 pounds, approximately 30 million pounds today, and transferring control of the lands to the government. However, several treaties still needed to be negotiated with local indigenous tribes in the Red River region to minimize resistance to development. An unexpected figure, Louis Riel, a Canadian politician based in the Red River territory, then emerged as a challenge for the government. Riel mobilized the Métis people, descendants of French-Canadian voyagers and local indigenous tribes, around issues of racial, religious, and language rights. In response to the government's assumed takeover of the Red River Territory, Riel organized his Métis followers into a resistance movement. At just 25 years old, he was elected president of the provisional government in the region, which declared independence from Canada and Britain in December 1869. As you can imagine, the federal government in Ottawa was a little irked by the formation of a breakaway government in the Red River region, and they considered it an act of treason. Hindered by additional complications, the federal government stayed out of Manitoba for most of 1870, leaving the status of Riel's province in a state of uncertainty. A significant concern was the possibility of Riel aligning with the United States, which would disrupt nearly a century of treaties between the two nations. Moreover, the Red River region constituted the most fertile land available west of Ontario within Canada's borders. Granting Riel's demands would essentially create a sovereign state within Canada, compromising the intended economic growth. Meanwhile, Riel was having his own problems as his Métis people were only one faction in the Red River region. The country-born people, also of mixed European and indigenous ancestry, were predominantly English and Protestant and often conflicted with the Métis. Riel handled the issue by bringing them into the fold, expanding the government to include a large number of country-born representatives. Nonetheless, Riel had his hands full with a faction of Canadians from Ontario, led by Dr. John Schultz, who stood to gain from Ottawa's investment. Clashes between Riel's forces and these Canadians culminated in the Plains War, which led to the arrest of several Ottawa loyalists and Thomas Scott. A recent immigrant from the north of Ireland, Scott was an infamous Orangeman, anti-Catholic Protestants named after William of Orange, with a marked hatred for Catholics. While other prisoners were released, Scott was executed without trial. Negotiations had been going well with Ottawa, both sides hopeful that war would be avoided, but the execution of Scott sparked a call for revenge in Ontario, which was dominantly British and Protestant. Toronto having its own fair few members of Orangemen and supporters. To avoid exacerbating tensions between Ontario and Quebec, Prime Minister Macdonald opted for diplomacy, sending a delegation to the Red River for negotiations. The delegation's efforts resulted in Manitoba achieving provincial status, thus quashing any concerns of Riel defecting to the United States. However, Macdonald showed little mercy to the Red River Provisional Government leaders, causing Riel to flee to the United States to evade execution. The Canadian government cracked down on the Métis and country-born populations they deemed as rebels, and the military drove most of them out of Manitoba. With full control over the new province and its resources, Macdonald established the city of Winnipeg, a mere 63 miles from the Minnesota border. Today, it remains the largest city in Manitoba with 90% of the province's population residing there. The challenges posed by the Canadian Shield during the settlement of Rupert's Land highlighted the need for a more efficient land transport system in Canada. Fortunately, a groundbreaking invention was about to emerge. Steam power, developed in the 18th century, fueled the Industrial Revolution, largely due to the innovative work of Scottish inventor James Watt. This new technology was soon harnessed to facilitate travel with the first prototype steam engine taking shape. Initially employed in Britain's renowned mining industry, 
Coal cars were horse-drawn along early railways, eventually giving way to cable cars powered by winches in both Canada and the United States as early as the 1820s. Although these methods had limited utility for travel, steam-powered rail lines quickly developed in the British Isles, boasting over 6,000 miles of track by 1850. In parallel, Canada saw the introduction of its first railway, the Champlain and St. Lawrence Railroad, in 1836, which ran between La Prairie on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River and St. Jean sur Richelieu, a distance of about 20 miles. As railways expanded eastward into the Maritimes, the Albion Mines Railway was completed in 1839 and remained relatively short range with a total length of only about 6.5 miles. The first attempt at creating a long-range railway for passenger travel emerged in the 1840s with the conception of the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railroad. This cooperative effort, benefiting both Canada and the United States, gained support from proponents in both Portland, Maine and Quebec, Canada, including John A. Poor and Alexander Tillock Galt. The primary goal of the railway was to provide regular access to the Atlantic Ocean for Quebec and establish a connection between Portland and Maine's hinterland. With Galt's influence in the Canadian Parliament, the Guarantee Act passed in 1849, providing government funding to proposed rail projects longer than 75 miles. Consequently, the 267-mile-long railway was funded and completed by 1853. Around the same time, Canadian politician and businessman Alec McNabb garnered support from investors on both sides of the border to build the Great Western Railway, running between Windsor and Niagara Falls, Ontario. Windsor is only two miles from Detroit, and Niagara Falls is just three miles from Niagara in New York. The relatively open nature of the border at that time allowed for comparatively easy use of the Great Western Railway by American interests. The introduction of steam trains significantly eased travel through Manitoba and Rupert's Land in general, following the resolution of the provisional government issue. In 1875, a railway spanning approximately 62 miles was laid, running from Emerson to St. Boniface, a French stronghold just outside Winnipeg. This railway also connected St. Boniface to St. Vincent, Minnesota establishing an all-rail route from the most populated port of Manitoba into the state. Once completed, the rail line became the primary mode of transportation from Ontario into the prairies for Anglo-Canadian settlers. Unfortunately for Macdonald, many immigrants settled in the United States instead, as there was insufficient access across Canada even with the train. The Macdonald government encountered fewer difficulties with the nomadic Plains Cree than with the Métis and country-born populations in Manitoba as they expanded into the grain-rich plains of Saskatchewan. Additionally, the Hudson's Bay Company held no claim on the land, simplifying matters for Ottawa. The main challenges in the region were lack of interest in transportation. Despite the expansion of the railroad, including further southern connections linking Minneapolis to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, which allowed American grain companies to benefit from the Canadian prairies, interest from Canadians and British immigrants in the drylands west of Manitoba remained limited. Until the 1870s, much of the Western Plains were simply too far from the commercial and social heart of Canada, located east of the Canadian Shield. The first successful widespread settlement of the Saskatchewan drylands originated from Eastern Europe as the government actively sought hardy farm workers from the Russian Empire who were accustomed to harsh, dry conditions to cultivate the largely unused Canadian land. Launched in 1896, this campaign resulted in a surge of settlers, the majority of whom were from what is now present-day Ukraine, arriving in the once vacant Saskatchewan drylands. Despite facing an initial language barrier, Ukrainian Canadians integrated relatively quickly into Canadian society. By 1911, the community had seen its members elected to public office at both municipal and provincial levels. By 1938, Ukrainians represented 2.2% of the Canadian population with the majority residing in the prairies, particularly Saskatchewan. Although Manitoba and Saskatchewan faced challenges in claiming and developing land, the province of Alberta proved relatively easier to both claim and utilize. In 1888, Macdonald implemented an ambitious plan called Gilded Grazing Leases to promote ranching in the prairies. The drylands were ideal for ranching due to their abundant supply of natural grasses and grains for cattle to feed. These leases granted up to 100,000 acres of land for a period of up to 21 years, with the growth of the cattle industry 
particularly around Calgary in south-central Alberta, the leases expanded to include homesteading rights by 1892. Supported by American investment in Alberta's thriving beef industry, train service expanded further west and south, connecting Alberta to lucrative American markets. With the primary focus on grain and beef production, the emerging cities of Regina in Saskatchewan and Calgary in Alberta, still the major population centers in their provinces, are located near the American border. Largely isolated throughout its history, the enigmatic land west of the Rocky Mountains, which would become British Columbia, had been inhabited by numerous First Nations tribes for thousands of years. Initial contact with outsiders mainly occurred on the western islands and coast, more accessible via the northwestern United States than from Canada. After the dispute with James Polk over the 5440 Latitude Territory, the first non-native settlements emerged around modern-day Vancouver in 1862. The accessible seaport provided direct connections to Asia and the northwestern United States. A thriving lumber industry began in 1863, partly driven by American lumberman Sewell Moody from Maine. By 1870, when most of the area was theoretically under Canadian control, regional administrators sent a surveyor to the rapidly expanding lumber settlements. This led to the establishment of the first official town site of Granville, named after Lord Granville. However, the area was more commonly known as Gastown after John Gassy Jack Dayton, the proprietor of the area's only legal saloon. But back then, Gassy didn't mean what it means today. Instead, the phrase was a slang term for an enthusiastic talker. One significant advantage of the town site was its location near the Pacific coast, featuring a natural port and the Fraser River, which followed from the north into the Pacific Ocean. The Canadian Pacific Railway, or CPR, chose this post as its westernmost stop connecting Vancouver to cities as far away as Toronto. CPR President William Van Horn recommended the name Vancouver after English explorer George Vancouver, officially incorporating the city in the spring of 1886. Van Horn's influence was crucial as the promise of extending the railway from Toronto through the prairies and the Rocky Mountains to British Columbia played a major role in the region joining Canada as a province in 1871. Vancouver's location just 32 miles from the U.S. border in Blaine, Washington, and with a natural port providing direct access to Asia across the Pacific, contributed to its rapid growth. It quickly became Canada's third major commercial and population center, joining Toronto and Montreal as one of the few Canadian cities widely known to Americans. Vancouver Island, also named after George Vancouver, had a less straightforward history. Most of the largest Gulf Island is within the Canadian border, right across from Vancouver. The southernmost tip, including the city of Victoria, was disputed during Polk's 5440 or fight campaign. Sir James Douglas, the first governor of British Columbia, declared the island a crown colony in 1849. This meant that the British government was obligated to defend the colony, making Polk more willing to negotiate. Vancouver Island officially joined the rest of British Columbia in 1866, one year before Canadian independence and six years before British Columbia became a province. The infertile, rocky landscape of the Canadian Shield and challenges in transportation alongside the cold climate were significant factors in Canadian population centers' proximity to the U.S. border. But what about Canada's other border with the United States? The oft-forgotten one. You might be surprised to learn that the majority of Canada's population in the far north still lives close to the U.S. border. How, might you ask? It's all thanks to President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a longtime supporter of statehood for Alaska, the former Russian territory that had been an official possession of the United States since 1867. His primary concerns regarding Alaskan statehood were national security and ownership. Alaska's proximity to the Soviet Union's Asian region during the Cold War made it a particular target for missile strikes. Following a series of tentative bills, including H.R. 7999, in the summer of 1958, Alaska was officially named the 49th state by the beginning of 1959. This designation created a northern border with Canada, placing the city of Whitehorse, Yukon, less than 100 miles from Skagway, Alaska, Today, Whitehorse, which is in the Yukon Territory capital city, boasts a population of 25,000, more than half of the territory's total population. 
While the lengthy shared border between Canada and the U.S. offers economic benefits, the border's initial design has also led to some unexpected challenges. An unexpected development in the town of Derbyline, Vermont, established in 1791, the town straddles the border between Vermont and Quebec due to the lapse in border regulations. This is most clearly seen in the Haskell Library and Opera House, the latter boasting a stage that is in Canada and seating which is in the United States. Another peculiar situation arises in Point Roberts, Washington. With a population of 1,100, this town on the Sawasan Peninsula in southwestern British Columbia can only be accessed by driving through Canada. The 17-mile journey to the nearest U.S. border crossing at Peace Arc became an issue when the U.S. heightened border security. This action isolated Point Roberts from essential services in Washington, leading to complications such as school buses being turned back to avoid international incidents. Moreover, during the U.S. government's intensified enforcement of immigration policies between 2016 and 2020, a growing number of immigrants sought to reach the U.S. via Canada intending to cross the border through prairies where fields seamlessly transition from one country to another without border checks. The allure of the vast, unguarded border led to migrants arriving in poor health, often afflicted with frostbite. The situation at the border between Canada and the United States has improved, though not to pre-9-11 levels. In states such as Washington, New York, Michigan, and Vermont, Border crossings are relatively easy due to their long history of common economic interests with Canada. Moreover, Canada's native-born population is aging, with an average national age of 41 and a low birth rate, compared to the United States average of 38 in 2020. This demographic trend has resulted in an over-concentration of the population in major cities, leading to a housing crisis due to high demand. As more young people pursue opportunities in economic powerhouses on either coast, the nation grapples with challenges in addressing its uneven population distribution, which is only getting worse and worse. To address the issue of population decline, the government is actively trying to attract new immigrants to the northern regions by offering strong incentives, such as the northern allowance added to pay on most jobs, this has led to better facilities and innovative shipping solutions to get supplies to northern communities. So, to sum it all up, Canada's population is mostly concentrated in cities near both the southern and northern borders with the United States due to a host of factors that include climate, agriculture, shipping opportunities, and of course, their long shared history. The easiest access to the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and the most fertile farmland of various forms are all available within 100 miles of the American borders, a situation which has led to the United States and Canada having a long and cooperative economic relationship that doesn't show any signs of going away.